Thank you everyone for joining. Welcome to this webinar. Um, this is called Privatization or Economic Democracy. And we at Partners for Dignity and Rights are really proud to host this and really pleased to have this excellent group of speakers joining us today. My name is Ben Pompquist. I work with Partners for Dignity and Rights. And this is the second webinar we're doing in a series um, on the new social contract. And so we are a national organization that works with grassroots groups around the country that are organizing to win economic and social rights. So things like housing, healthcare, work with dignity and education as fundamental rights for everybody. And uh, we're excited to dig into this topic with the folks today. So before we jump in, I just wanna say a quick word about somebody who just passed. One of our founding board members, Dr. Paul Farmer, a really inspiring person who touched a ton of lives around the world. He was a founder of um, Partners in Health, um, which is a global health organization, and really, I think, was instrumental in working in Haiti and Rwanda and many countries around the world in making sure that people who have been shut out of, priced out of, of privatizing uh, healthcare systems have been able to get um, the medical care they need and the social supports they need in order to live healthy lives. And so, you know, all of our movements are really about collective work, but I, I do think that he was a really, um, by all accounts, a singularly important person and just um, in inspiring a lot of people. I want to read a quick quote from uh, Sharda Sakharin, one of our co-founders, um, but I'll first pass it actually to Kenyon, uh, Kenyon Farrow, one of our speakers today who I'll, who I'll introduce in a sec. Um, but Kenyon, I knew Paul, and so Kenyon, I'd like to invite you to say, say something. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I knew probably like a lot of you, but I knew about Paul Farmer before I met him. Um, I met him, uh, I think in 2013 um, at a, a conference in Paris and <laughs> had dinner and drinks with him afterwards. And, um, kept in touch over the years and um, and actually was scheduled to have a call with him on Friday about some work in Rwanda that my organization Prep for All was going to partner with Partners in Health to, to do. Um, so it was completely shocking and devastating to hear yesterday. And I, I, the only thing I would, I would add is that, um, you know, Paul Farmer was, in addition to, you know, kind of advocating and, and and actually providing you know medical care in a lot of um parts of the world but his i think his sort of legacy is really about a vision of decolonizing global health and and public health as uh is currently structured and so you know those of us who who work in, in public health um and thinking about ways to do things especially now in the context of a global pandemic uh, that are not, um, you know, extractive of of communities and exploitive of communities. Uh, old, old Paul Farmer, a, a great dad, and, and to say too, he was one of the um, advocates uh, in 20 years ago when there were a lot of people in global health who thought we should not be giving a, the at the time new HIV treatments to people in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or in Haiti because. Uh, they were not going to be adherent to the medication and would therefore cause all kinds of drug resistance. That was like the prevailing logic. And Paul Farmer was one of the voices uh, globally that was pushing against that kind of rhetoric and really pushed with a, a bunch of folks around the globe to make sure that people everywhere had access to those life-saving medications. So uh, I, um, yeah, uh, it was hard to hear yesterday, but um, you know, we are continuing with his work and legacy. Thank you, Kenyon. Yeah, and um, Sharda, one of our co-founders wrote um, just briefly, my dream for the human rights vision is to inspire love for humanity and dedication to making a world where every person has equal possibility and the chance to thrive. Paul Farmer's legacy is anchored in that vision. He resonated hope in every person he touched. And so it's in that spirit that we're going to enter into this conversation and into our work ahead um, to try to carry on that legacy. Um, I'm very honored to have these speakers with us today. Um, so you just met Kenyon. Kenyon is a writer, editor, and strategist and the managing director in, of advocacy and organizing with Prep for All. He's also a former co-executive director of our organization, Partners for Dignity and Rights. 
We also have Dr. Amy Freed, who's the John Mitchell Nickerson Professor of Political Science at the University of Maine. Um, she's done a ton of work on public opinion in the United States over the years, and most recently is the co-author with Douglas B. Harris of the book At War with Government, How Conservatives Weaponize Distrust from Goldwater to Trump. And last but not least, we have Donald Cohen, who's the founder and executive director of In the Public Interest, which is an organization dedicated to building understanding about the harms of privatization and to strengthening, adequately funding, and building popular support for government that works for all of us. He is the co-author with Alan McCallion of the book, The Privatization of Everything, How the Plunder of Public Goods Transformed America and How We Can Fight Back. And so um, in just a second, I'm gonna turn things over because there's a ton I'm excited to hear from folks, but to just sort of underline the main themes of this conversation, um, we are living sort of at, what may be the tail end, we don't know yet, of a decades long era of privatization that has really dominated our public life and many of our, many aspects of our private lives. Privatization is in many ways, I think as we'll hear, you know, sort of one of the central stories um, and that has dominated politics over the decades. And I think really continues to be at the center of a lot of the biggest fights in, in politics and in society today. And I want to underline, I think this is a theme we'll hear that attacks on government are attacks on people. So there are attacks on specific groups of people, black people and immigrants, women and trans people, poor people, and many, many others. But there are also attacks on the very idea that we are a people, a collective, um, a nation who have shared needs, mutual interests, things that we can't achieve and meet on our own um, and mutual responsibilities to one another. So we're gonna be doing some unpacking today of what has privatization, how did this happen? What are the effects on our lives and what can we do about it? And it's, I'm really quite excited to end on that point too of really a hopeful solutions oriented note. So we will do our best to um, draw out some paths forward. So without further ado, I would love to start things with you, Donald. I know um, sort of documenting privatization, fighting for government and public goods has been at the heart of your work. And um, can you tell us a little bit in particular about your recent book, The Privatization of Everything, and some of the main themes that, that you cover there? So it is a 300-page book. So I'm going to do this, the, the, the three-minute version. Uh, you get a minute, 100 pages. So... Amy's going to talk about the attack on government, and so uh, I thought she was going to go first. But so, and I'll let that happen because that's that's. But that's an important part of the story. There's been a 40-year attack on government, and the conservatives who believe in the market, who want to get their hands on government spending, have have taken advantage of you know negative attitudes towards government to position themselves as reformers. And the reformer and the reform of one of the reforms of choice, they have cut taxes as one, but also privatize, give it to the market, give it to the private sector, because the private sector is more efficient and the government is wasteful and all that. So, you know, there's a there's a strategic importance of privatization for us and for, you know, and, and for those that are trying to dismantle and weaken government or at least capture government and, uh, and weaken it in their interest. So I define privatization a little bit broader than many people think. I define it as private control over public goods or private control and authority over the things that we should be able to decide together. Like whether everyone should have health care, whether our air should be clean, whether everyone, every kid should be highly educated or have access to college. I mean, sort of the basics and fundamentals. And there, you know, there are a variety of ways that that control is captured. I'll tell a quick story because I think it's helpful to start. You know, some of you may know this. I know Tom Tresser does because he's on and he lives in Chicago. Um, Chicago sold their parking meters in 2008 or nine, I can't remember which year. Um, it sold meaning for um, what they did is for $1.1 billion upfront. Now this is in the Great Recession, cities bleed in red ink. They sold control of their city's 36,000 parking meters for 75 years until 2083. Okay, so long time. Short part of the, I mean, you can, there's more to say here. It, terrible deal, incredibly stupid way to borrow money in your future revenue. But the point being that this is, it showed how clearly that privatization is an assault on democracy and its massive extraction of resources for private gain as opposed to public things and public services. The reason being that for the life of the contract, 
if a if the city the transit agency wants to, if, of the city wants to eliminate parking spots you know temporarily for a street fare but more importantly for permanently for dedicated bus lanes or for bike lanes or to can turn a neighborhood into a pedestrian mall because land use patterns change then they have to basically buy the spots back they have to pay right it's not technically buy because um but it's they have to basically pay to, you know for the future value of the spot and so what does that do that makes that ties the hands of elected officials who are responsible for land use and housing and transportation and you know that's their fundamental you know governing responsibilities at the city level because you know they'll often not do things because they just don't have the resources to do it you know then of course you know parking rates went way up they're going to make their money back i think in like 15 years or something like that so there's sort of a massive amount of money that's going to you know three three uh, it was a consortium of three companies morgan stanley three uh, entities a sovereign wealth fund from the Middle East and a national parking company are going to take a massive amount of money out of that region that could be used for buses and housing and all sorts of other things. So bottom line, the idea in the book that we really want to get across is this is about democracy. It's about ability to control the stuff that we should be controlling. How's that? Excellent. Thank you, Donna. And next up, Amy, as Donna mentioned, You've been do doing a lot of extensive documentation of the longstanding strategic attack on government. Could you tell us a little bit about that and, and sort of the story you tell in your book? Absolutely. Um, you know, and thanks so much for inviting me. So, uh, yeah, this book that I have out recently at War with Government with Doug Harris, what we do is we chronicle a very long effort by American conservatives to promote distrust in government for various political benefits. And um, we don't spend as much time on this as spelling some of this out as Donald and his co-authors do, but we do see also government needed for pursuing collective needs. And part of that is both things that government will do, but also to restrict the to restrict private power. You, you cannot check private power without having public power. Um, in any case, um, a lot of social scientists saw this big plunge in political distrust, which really starts around in the polling around 1964, as just a kind of byproduct, a response to events. And, and we argue that it's not something that just happened, that it's something that um, that conservatives started to focus on to deliver particular kinds of benefits for themselves. Now, that doesn't mean that we think everyone should trust government all the time. Absolutely not. There's plenty of reasons to distrust government. And it's also uh, at, you know, at certain points, certain things. Um, and, and also, there's a very long strand in American political history involving distrust in government. Still, um, there was really this effort to build on that and uh, to harness distrust politically and often tying that, as has been mentioned already, to issues around race and deservingness. Um, so the four, we say there's like four main ways that, that uh, conservatives have used distrust in government or have tried to use distrust in government. And we go through this in you know, a lot of detail over time. But um, one is you know, simply as a, in elections to make different uh, kinds of arguments and try to get voters to be on your side to promote distrust in government. Another is to build and maintain coalitions. So it to be a kind of central organizing principle and building a political coalition. Another is to use messages around distrust when it comes to political institutions to try to shift power from institutions conservatives control um, uh, away from institutions they, they don't control to institutions they do. So you, you know, you'll see these flip-flops over time when it comes to institutional arguments like about the power of uh, the presidency. So you know, when Obama's president, he's a tyrannical and he's a czar and signing statements are terrible. And then you know, Trump comes in and all of a sudden you're back to this incredibly strong presidency and Bill Barr saying, you know, you can't, the president basically can do whatever he wants. Um, but that's that the, the third, third of the fourth one is the institutional. And then also just in a lot of policy battles. And the book in particular says a lot about healthcare 
um, with all the cases, but it shows up with lots of other issues as well. So um, we're stressing the what is being done by conservative leaders, party leaders, elected officials, while also mentioning a bit the role of conservative media, the rise of the religious right, and um, a whole libertarian billionaire effort, <laughs> which you know others have chronicled. And sometimes what's happened in this time is that elites have empowered and let loose certain parts of the public that then in some ways are hard for them to control. So, you know, Mitch McConnell's not really that crazy about certain aspects of uh, the Trumpian right, but, you know, it's also helping him get, get uh, people elected. So he likes it in that way. Okay, just a couple of final points in outlining, you know, our arguments. And one is just simply that, um, you know, although we see skepticism as a, as a democratic virtue, what's developed, especially over time, you know, more recently, is this really wholesale de delegitimization of, of uh, government as a means to limit public power and to achieve the collective good. And we see this, you know, this whole delegitimization of our elections, all of these public health efforts in this COVID period. So, you know, certain amount of distrust, as I said, it's healthy, it's good, it's part of democracy, but it's really gotten very, you know, far away from what, what should be healthy. And although um, there isn't any single magic bullet to, to address this, um, we do lay out a number of different strategies in the book in, in the, the last full chapter. Um, so I'm really looking forward to talking about that as we, as we work through, but I want to talk too much just to start us off. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, and last but not least, Kenyon, and to my knowledge, you don't have a book out quite yet, but um, I'm excited to hear from you. Um, we've already been hearing about public health, and as we all know in this era, it's just so uh, clearly these sort of like erosion of public goods and government and sort of um, delegating things to the private sector has done a lot of harm in terms of COVID, but you've, you've been working on a number of fronts. So could you tell us a little bit about um, really some of the themes that animate your work and how that connects up with these, these themes we're talking about. Sure, uh, and you're correct. Um, I don't have a book out, but I, I do have an essay in a new book uh, that's out called Abolition for the People, uh, edited by Colin Kaepernick, actually. And uh, my essay is about um, COVID-19 and uh, prisons and prisons as a uh, prime, prisons and jails as a primary driver of, of epidemics. Um, so uh, to this question about, um, you know, sort of privatization and um, the space of work, I, I work in public health primarily on infectious disease. And um, it is, so just to, we'll use COVID-19 as a contemporary example of the ways in which um, privatization has impacted our public health response. So first and foremost, um, many people, uh, you know, have seen uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci on television and are familiar with him as the director of the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, which is uh, one of the institutes within the National Institutes of Health, the, National, the NIH. A lot of people think he's the director of the NIH, but he's not. He's the director of the uh, agency that focuses on uh, allergies and infectious diseases. And Dr. Fauci's role is to um, really sort of direct the research priorities around infectious diseases, uh, you know, at the NIH. Um, in that in that agency. Um, so when we look at, say, um, the COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine process, one of the three major vaccines that was, uh, you know, ultimately approved by the FDA, the Moderna vaccine, uh, we call it the Moderna vaccine after the company, but it was actually the vaccine that the U.S. government had the most uh, stake in actually helping develop. And in general, uh, for many conditions, um, most uh, new, whether vaccines or, or other treatments or medical devices even, um, are developed by uh, researchers through, uh, you know, public 
funds, right, through government, mostly NIH or other agencies, sometimes development. And a lot of times those researchers are situated in many of our universities in those research uh, schools, right? Be they, um, you know, biochemistry, microbiology, virology, public health, et cetera. Um, those researchers uh, do the backbone of the work with government and public funds to develop uh, these these treatments. And this, you know, the COVID-19, the Moderna vaccine is, is no less. We should be calling it the people's vaccine because we paid for the bulk of the research for it. But um, what ended up happening was, and this is true uh, in more cases than not, the government um, will partner with um, a, a pharma company once a you know set of research has moved generally past you know phase one or phase two trial because the companies have the manufacturing capacity to really develop the drug to develop drugs and usually as so at the point at which the companies sort of get involved in drug development. Um, if it's not their own sponsored research. And at this point in time, most of it isn't. Most of it is actually publicly funded research. Um, the government usually allows them to just take the, the intellectual property uh, for their role in helping sort of, you know, bring a drug to quote unquote market with no, uh, you know, kind of guardrails on the cost, the pricing, the the access to to the drug or whatever um it just essentially becomes the property of the pharma company even though we pay for it so we as the public end up typically paying twice right so we paid for the research that led to the development in this case of the COVID 19 the moderna vaccine uh but then we do nothing to uh then require those companies to set a, an affordable price or to make sure that the drug is, uh, you know, that, that it is accessible in all communities or in fact, the globe, um, you know, in the case of what we're seeing in terms of real vaccine hoarding by uh, the high income countries, uh, mostly the United States uh, and Western Europe. Um, so just in the case of, of, of actual vaccine access, and this is also, I could just say quickly too, could be said even about why we ran out of tests, right, for COVID-19 in the fall was largely because there was a, a, a really botched and mismanaged, a terrible kind of development program at CDC under the Trump administration to develop uh, uh, tests, uh, to te like home tests to, to test for um, COVID um, that they ultimately abandoned and partnered with the, um, you know, companies that developed those, you know, the different, um, you know, tests that we, you know, now have uh, access to. Now, the government could have actually um, taken the, the manufacturing, the intellectual property from those companies and then made a manufacturer produce them. That, you know, we often hear about those things in wartime. And as a section of the US trade and patent law called section 1498, which a lot of like, you know, intellectual property like drug <laughs> development nerds like myself are aware of, which gives the US government power to actually seize a patent of a, of a drug or medical device or whatever, and to, and to, uh, produce it right in another way so that it can be used. The last time this happened in the United States was during 9-11 when there were, were after 9-11 when there was the sort of anthrax scares right around the country. The, there was one manufacturer of, a, of an anthrax treatment and the government used uh, section 1498 to take over to produce enough of that treatment so that if there was a, a massive anthrax outbreak, we could have uh, adequately responded to it. So we have those sorts of tools available, but they're very rarely often used in the name of, of uh, you know, giving corporations sort of more power. And in the case of public health, it's really, you know, people's lives being sort of abandoned about for, for corporate, corporate profit. Thanks, Kenyon. Yeah, it's just so enraging when I think about how the pandemic continues, and especially internationally, with so many people around the world remaining unvaccinated, um, just because these the vaccines are not being made available. I'd love to ask you all a little bit more about sort of who who's behind this agenda, right? This push for privatization. So we've been hearing about profiteers, whether in the pharmaceutical industry or with Chicago's um, parking system. And, you know, Amy, you were also speaking to sort of the um, 
political entrepreneurs, right, who are sort of using, uh, weaponizing distrust against government for their own political ends. Can you say a little bit about that, more about the sort of the political angles and who else is a part of this, this coalition that really since the, I would argue, since the civil rights movement and Goldwater in that era um, has really been fighting back against government and against public action? Well, yeah, I mean, I, in a way, you're, you're simply just asking me to describe the GOP coalition and the development of, you know, Republican coalition. And, you know, I, I think, you know, even before, even before, um, you know, Reagan, you know, I, it, gee, it's like, it's like, where do we even start, right? You know, in some ways, uh, Reagan's a good place to start, but um, you know where the the big shift, of course, in American politics happens is the it, one of the big shifts is the movement of um, white Southerners to the Republican Party, which happens initially even with Harry Truman supporting desegregation of the armed forces and starting to, you know, support civil rights. Um, that's in 1940. That's way back in way back in 1948 and. You know the 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 white South at the time, which is obviously a white supremacist, you know, segregationist South, but it's, it's still at a, at that point, it's perfectly fine to have public money come into the South and help with economic development. Um, it's only really later that there's you know real of the, really this push away um, as you get the rise of kind of this libertarian movement, anti-tax movement in, in the 1960s, and then the rise of Reagan and Reagan's like purportedly libertarian and, and is in some ways, but isn't in other ways, you know, supports the growth of the military and, you know, military industrial complex. But Reagan and then in, in, into, into Gingrich, there's a real intensification of attacks on government and uh, and using all of the tools of public opinion technologies to help plan that, you know, using polls, using focus groups, doing message testing, coming up with the the wording that will be used to fight against any kind of public programs, you know, in some ways that's really radicalized with the Tea Party and then with Trump and becoming much more overtly racist and xenophobic in recent years. There was a book like 20 years ago that political scientists read about called The Race Card uh, by Tolly Mendelberg from Princeton, you know, and she was like, people can't be overtly racist anymore. So it's being done in this implicit race card way. Well, that's, you know, I think it's gone back the other way. But it's still, you know, with Trump, an odd sort of situations that he used in some ways very populist, you know, arguments that weren't always on the right in 2016. He said he wanted to tax the wealthy. He said he wanted to give everybody health care. So you had that kind of um, you had you had that kind of uh, rhetoric, you know, more in some ways left progressive rhetoric, in, but then also taught. But then when he came in, of course, that's not what he did at all. And he did pursue privatization. I think Donald's the one to ask about, like, who who put all of this into place when it came to privatization? I I would point a lot to the growth of the, these, you know, libertarian billionaire efforts that go from doing everything from trying to shift the court system and funding the federal society and legal programs in different places. They have been very, very strategic over a long period of time to try to um, get their tentacles into lots of different states and localities. I'd also, I, I know I'm talking a long time, I will stop, but I just wanna mention that today, Rick Scott of Florida put out a kind of GOP blueprint as, as be, on behalf of Senate Republicans. And it is really has a very, very strong privatization agenda as part of it. So this is something very much still in the minds of certain Republicans who are, who are, who are going down that path. Yeah, I, I can, if it's okay, I can 
Ben, can I add a little bit to that question? So I, I sort of have a simple and reductionist analysis because <laughs> I, I have the, you know, because I'm not a scholar. So I, I think there are, it's far more complicated than this, but because Amy laid it out, but there, I, I go back to three forces. So first there's the ideolo ideological, um, you know, true believers, right? They really have a different idea of the role of the state and the role of individuals. I like to read a quote from Milton Friedman in not in the 50s, this was more just as an example. In my ideal world, government would not be responsible for providing education any more than it is for providing food and clothing. Just as you know, as an illustration of, you know, he's a true, he's an, you know, he's an intellect. And, you know, and there's a lot of folks who are true believers, right? That's number one. Number two, aside from COVID. Before COVID, governments in America spent $7 trillion a year. It's more now, right, because of COVID. If you're a corporation, it isn't so much, I don't even think it's profiteering. I think it's marketing. <laughs> it's looking for business. Right? Now, they're going to extract a lot of money. So there are mass, and, and corporations got organized in the late 80s and took associations to advocate for contracting out and stuff. But they're, you know, they're all over the country now. What's different now from, say, 20 years ago is, maybe 25 years ago is, you know, corporate America, the sales folks from the prison, prison company and water and all these now really know how to work states and cities. They're, you know, they really have their, they, know, they got the capacity to do it. So that's number two, they just want to sell stuff. And, you know, it's a pot of gold. And the third is, you know, kind of a little bit, Amy was talking about kind of the political class, as it were, you know, that, um, which includes candidates who want to get elected, but it also includes the strategists, right? And so, you know, folks like Grover Norquist and others. And the one thing that, uh, in terms of privatization, uh, there's a fellow named Stuart Butler who was writing for Heritage and Cato, I'm sure you've probably read, who, you know, Reagan failed to privatize much for two reasons. Democrats still controlled the Congress and the New Deal consensus, people still wanted the stuff, right? So they just didn't make, you know, didn't, didn't go forward. But what, so the, the right wingers, the ideologues, the strategists were frustrated, at, but they realized that privatization was a, a strategy to break the pro-government, pro-budget consensus by directing our demands, because we want the stuff, we want the services to the private sector and organizing the private sector. So it was actually a key strategic insight that they had that they could see, I mean, even though it isn't true, that this is a way to reduce the budget, this is a way to, you know, Basically, it's a, clearly a way to offload staff because now there, you know more staff are in contractors than there are in, for, for public agencies. So that's how I put it: is those sort of three constellations that are really drivers, and then they use racism and the evangelicals and the gun nuts and excuse me, if, if, anyway, gun the gun advocates. Let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I could add to that, I was actually going to focus on kind of the 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 you know advocate side. So you know. One of the ways in which they do that, and it's all all the parties that have been aforementioned, um, certainly the pharmaceutical companies from you know, my vantage point in the work are um, very active in a couple of different ways. So one is, you know, a lot of there's been, you know, over the last, you know, whatever, 30 years almost, um, a lot of attention to free trade agreements, right? And the impact on the American worker and these kinds of frameworks. But what often is not, is le less discussed in those different free trade agreements is like the role of pharmaceutical companies in those because what, why they're invested in uh, certain terms of free trade agreements is around um, patents, right? And so if they get to kind of, you know, control the way in which sort of, you know, patent and intellectual property law happens so that they can maintain, uh, you know, um, the patents over brand name drugs and kind of help extend them globally in perpetuity and avoid or, or great or kind of greatly control when, uh, you know, generic, you know, options can be produced. They do that through the free trade agreements often, right? So in a lot of outside of a lot of the kind of access to medicine kind of activism, that part of like the free trade agreement sort of players is often like it is often sort of missed. Um, so that is one piece. And then the other thing they do is, you know, um, from, you know, a number of like sort of corporations, they sort of use soft power by funding, you know, uh, 
nonprofit organizations, right? Uh, to keep, and it, it is a, it is one of the reasons why, you know, in this country, the the AIDS movement in you know the eighties and nineties, which was at so sort of pro uh, single payer, you know, what we would call Medicare for all right now. Uh, was a vociferous uh, proponent of that. Was also um, highly critical of of the role of pharmaceutical companies um, in making uh, U.S. like you know sort of healthcare and regulatory policy. Um, and yet, um, what has happened is um, those a lot of those pharmaceutical companies, particularly Gilead Sciences, which is actually now the largest funder of HIV-related community-based organizations in the United States and might be the world if I look at the, the funders concerned about AIDS report. They provide more funding. And so there should be, so there's no surprise then that there is a base of organizations that are, you know, concerned about, you know, public health and in the case of HIV and healthcare and those sort of things are often very silent on some of the issues around drug pricing and around, uh, you know, healthcare access to certain extent. They, they will, they will often, you know, kind of come for the, the, the insurance companies for not paying for certain things, but they won't look at like what the insurance companies are controlling often for costs, which is set by the pharmaceutical industry, right? So um, that is also one of the ways in which like the players, and it, it, not just pharma companies too, but you know, we see, you know, uh, soft drink companies who provide, who will pay for, you know, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, like, you know, event. And those things actually do matter in terms of what those members, and I'm just using the CDC as an example, because uh, there's lots of them in Congress, but, you know, what what kinds of, of, of policy they're going to, uh, you know, be willing to influence or, or put forth or, or endorse. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's being said just speaks to just what, we see in the American political system as a whole, the, you know, we call it porous, but it's like, who is there? Who is able to show up at a regular time, you know, all the time, who can, who can fund people to monitor all this stuff and, and to show up, you know, and to, and to have an, you know, to try to have an impact on, on some of these things that are just kind of below the surface for most people. It's hard enough to really follow much of anything, you know, an average person that's going on politically when you're busy, you know, if you're raising kids or whatever else you're doing, you know, going to work. So, you know, yeah, I think the profit side of it is 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 hugely important and that, it, you know, they're going to be there. They're going to be there when decisions are made and making friends and, um, you know, really so the even though I'm like kind of jumping ahead to solutions or whatever, it's like the only, the one of the main things that has to happen is to counter organize really and to, and to, for other people to be there to, you know, to figure out how to monitor all the stuff that's going on and to, and to counteract it. Uh, because otherwise, you know, yeah, I mean, like, you know, people, people, people don't, it's very rare, like even for an average person participating in like they a rulemaking process, let alone, you know, I mean, that's just not gonna, that's not gonna happen. So it's, it's just hard. It's hard, you know, and, and a lot of it is a reflection of, of our, our political system and who decision makers are talking to. And, you know, and I think it's important to, you know, to, to, to Amy's points and, the, and her work, it's the one of the outcomes of the assault on government. I mean, negative attitudes is a clear, but also we're swimming in a sea, a, a pro-market anti-government sea, right? That, and everybody is, the, you know, the bureaucracy is the, you know, and the belief in private sector is more efficient than public sector. Um, you know, we need competition. We need, you know, the profit motive. We need those things they are not, you know, those are real things. But that those ideas have become beliefs and sort of operating principles at deep levels, not because they're all bad people. It's just get to see we're swimming in. Yeah, that's a great point. Can you actually, Donald, like help us sort of pivot a little and try to raise our heads out of that sea and think like imagine a little what would it look like or feel like if we actually 
had more, you know, public goods that we could really rely on more and more sort of, of a sense of social solidarity with each other. And so I don't know if it would be helpful to think about a specific case, like, you know, the next pandemic that comes along or something like, how could we be better positioned? Um, you know, what, what would change if we, if we had more of this sort of collective commitment to each other? Right. Well, let me, I may answer it exactly the same way, but I may answer a slightly different articulation that I knew you meant, if, but, I'll, but I'll get into it and I'll decide. So first off, I think the, there are, because it's important to remember, they played the long game. We need to play the long game. Okay. That's really important. So they have turned us into individual, you know, the more insecure we are because we don't have health care and we can't afford college, the more we're thinking about ourselves and we're not realizing, you know, we're, you know, which is a normal human thing, right? The less we feel like we are really in it together. I mean, social security for those of us that are getting there um, and Medicare already here, um, you know, we're, we are in it together. You go after Medicare, you go after social security, you know, you have a constituency that's going to protect it because it's all, it's universal. I mean, and I know there's levels, you know, all that. So I think it's really important for us to sort of articulate over and over again the fact of our interdependence, right? That I want a good school for my kids, but I also, and because so they'll do well, but I also also understand that every kid needs to be educated not as a, just as a matter of values, because that's good for me also. It's good for society, it's good for the economy, it's good for democracy. So we have to sort of internalize and really advocate for that interdependence because in fact, it is a fact. You know, COVID taught us that. This is why I've been saying this a lot. The health of all of us depends on the health of each of us, right? Pretty clear from COVID. And you could go down the list and all those things. So, um, First off, so that's the first thing for us to imagine. And we have to change sort of, not all, but we have to change core values and core governing ideas, move it in that direction, more community. You know, I don't know what the direction is. You could say left, right, communitarian versus singular, you know, versus individualistic, but that's super important. Um, now I actually don't remember how you asked the question. So I'm gonna let you either try again or, <laughs> or say that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, that was a great answer of really sort of like, um, figuring out how to build a more of a culture of really recognizing our interdependence. Um, well, it's culture and based on fact. Yes, yes. It's a drumbeat, right? It's because everyone thinks it's their, it, you know, we're individualists, right? We think, you know, the kind of common ethic is you are responsible for your own fate, right? And to some extent, that's true. We're not against personal responsibility, but it's way beyond that. Right, and we need to be able to do both things. Talk about individual responsibility, but you know, individuals can't build a road, can't make everybody give everybody health care, can't you know? I mean, so th th we've got to figure out how to do both of those things. Yeah, and I think something you're talking about, and I know Amy's written on, is you know, we do have still have a lot of models of public goods that. Um, despite attempts from the right have not been dismantled. And so Social Security and Medicare have held up well. I think Medicaid, although it is being slowly privatized, two thirds of people on, on Medicaid now are outsourced to private insurance companies, but still there's more of a public commitment to the importance of Medicaid, not just for people on Medicaid, but as a, as a public good for all of society than I think we've had um, in decades or perhaps ever. Um, and, you know, we still have, um, they've tried to dismantle K-12 education public schools, but we still have, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of inequities, but we still have a, a strong public schools across the country. And so there are a lot of things I think we can still point to. Let's see, we have a couple questions. One is from uh, attendees. One is um, asking us to speak a little bit about, you know, Amy, as you said, the um, it's particularly the initiative to privatize has been driven in large part by the right, but it's actually been sort of supported by partisan, um, by a bipartisan coalition, right? Corporations are funding both political parties and Democrats, um, as well as Republicans are listening to groups um, like, for example, the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, so could, could any of you speak to a little bit about how sort of the, the, the role that Democrats in general have played in enabling privatization um, and also that perhaps if you know anything, the role of the Council on Foreign Relations in particular? I'll start. So I don't know about the Council on Foreign Relations, but I do know that the 
I mean, some Democrats, right? I, I actually don't even like to talk about the Democrats as a, as a, because they're clearly not a unified bunch, <laughs> if, if not, but for cinema and mansion, but beyond, but beyond that, Tammy Duckworth uh, made a proposal, uh, introduced legislation a couple of years ago that would have helped drive privatization of water. Um, so there's um, historically Clinton institutionalized privatization in the federal government, not Reagan, Clinton. Welfare reform, the National Performance Review that, that with the Gore Commission, you know, he supercharged privatization. That number one. Number two, it's you know, it's in the it's it, it's in the there is not a clear anti-privatization consensus among the Democratic caucus, to put it that, you know, at the at the federal level and at the national level. So I, I think at the at that level, it's not fully bipartisan, but there is bipartisan concern. Now, so at the local and state level, that's also true, but there's a difference there. When you're run, and you're a mayor and you're running a city and somebody comes forward and says, cheaper, better, faster, and one less headache, you're swimming in a sea that says, you know, maybe that's true and no new taxes, they always say that. It's nonsense, but they always say it. You know, you're swimming in a, and you're swimming in the sea that, that you know, probably right, you know? So there's, a, there's other, forces that drive that at the, you know, that I think are understandable because governing is hard, but no less problematic. Yeah, I just would add that I think, yeah, the right, I was, I was thinking of Clinton and welfare reform as like the primary example of how the Democrats kind of really just got pretty full sail on board with privatization with some, some exceptions and some of the newer members of Congress uh, being, uh, you know, probably more contrary to that agenda, which is causing some problems <laughs> within the party in, in ways that I appreciate. Um, but also, um, yeah, the, the, I mean, when you look at it at every level, I mean, if we look at even at the Affordable Care Act, um, that, you know, there was a push by advocates, including myself at the time, to at least try to get this kind of federal public option in place. Uh, and, and it was uh, been reported by many people that the Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi and others, were talking publicly that they were fighting for this public option to remain, but they really were not. They had already, and, they, and in fact, you know, Obama set the, the sort of table of the discussion with the insurance companies and pharma companies and basically ask them what they want, like what they would basically put up with, right? That was the starting point for the policy making as opposed to what kind of healthcare system is best and makes sense for um, you know, the public. And then they had no kind of coherent messaging around it. So it became this, you know, kind of, you know, public battle uh, in many ways that doesn't make any sense because guess what? People hate health insurance. They hate it. They hate that everyone hates their health insurance. Like, let's just cut to the chase. <laughs> no one likes them. So, that, which, which is easy to message, right? Everybody knows that. But the fact that the Democrats didn't talk that in that plane of terms about it, like you, like let's admit it, they're they're already rationing your care because guess what? Every denial you get, every bill you get in the mail is a tacit denial of your care. They didn't talk about it like that because they were too invested in uh, making nice with, uh, in this particular case, the insurance companies and pharma companies, and you know so. It, so therefore, you know, we are, uh, you know, kind of dealing with the ramifications of that to the extent that even in the case of a global pandemic, we had to basically embarrass the White House into sending test kits to everybody, which in some countries that is what be, like people get a te get test kits mailed to them every week, right, for the household. Um, and we had to like scrap to get like, you know, two tests sent one time. I mean, that is the that is the role of, of privatization within the Democratic Party by one example. Yeah, I mean, I, I think with, you know, Obama passing the Affordable Care Act, they were trying to prevent what happened to Clinton when they got attacked by the pharmaceutical companies and the health insurers and, you know, all that sort of thing where all of these just under the surface anti-government, you know, sorts of feelings could get you know, incited and pulled out. And 
but there's no doubt that, you know, that's where they started. Actually, the Affordable Character, I'd say, really started the year before with Max Bacchus working behind the scenes, yeah. putting together a whole, yeah, a whole structure for it. And really, when we think about the the, the most popular policies in, in the U.S. are, besides Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. And Medicaid, you know, is still was hasn't been expanded to all states. Of course, it was supposed to have originally under the ACA, and then the Supreme Court made it voluntary. You know, so that's also an issue with our courts. Uh, what's happened with our courts? But all of the referenda. My my understanding is that all the referenda in states that have referenda for Medicaid expansion passed. I'm in yeah. Maine. And we had this very, you know, far right guy, Paul LePage as governor, he called himself Trump before Trump, he's actually running again for governor. But anyway, he had to go out for four years because we have term limits, but he can come back. But he over and over again, uh, vetoed Medicaid expansion when it got passed by the legislature, then we had a referendum and he refused to put it in place and it took Till we had a, you know, Janet Mills as our governor to do it. And he's not saying what he would do if he got into office. He just says, I won't do anything if I think it's bad for the main people. But that's not saying what he thinks he would do. <laughs> so, you know, even on things that are, you know, really have very strong popular support that manage to get past, even if they're far from perfect, they're better than nothing i guess you know yeah or even a lot better than nothing it's just hard to defend them sometimes and you know with 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 uh, you know and implement them given um given what the court did given what different state you know where different states are right and you're and you're right about that but and i would but i would say add it kind of i think um i can't remember uh if you were donald said at the beginning the sort of protracted battle that the right has been on you know basically since the new deal right um people sort of mark frankly as the kind of beginning of the forming of the new right that we begin to see in the 1950s and 60s that had the democrats from the time that they tried when you know clinton was you know bill clinton was president and hillary clinton worked on that first bill had they created a strategy so that 20 years later <laughs> right, the conversation would be different. We'd be in a different place, but they didn't do that. Right, they there was no the Democrat, not and not just the Clintons, but the Democratic Party as a whole didn't go. Okay, so we lost that battle. What did we learn, and how are we going to continue to sow the seeds so that we, you know, kind of poison the privatization well in terms of rhetoric and frameworks or whatever, and begin to draw people's attention to the ways in which privatization hurts them, we would probably have been in a different place in 2009 when we got ready to like write this new bill. But we weren't, we were actually worse in terms of the public understanding of the public, right, and public good than we were in the 19, early 1990s. Yeah, and I, I would totally agree with you. And it ta it would take more of a long, you know, a long term st strategic effort, both on, you know, rhetoric and ideas, but also organization on a lot of different levels is really, you know, is really what's what's uh, required. We, you know, um, we don't have the Koch brothers or, you know, those kinds of groups on the on on the left. I don't think that's how there hasn't been someone who's, you know, or groups, small groups of people who have really put in that kind of, that kind of effort. So I think ultimately, besides all of us and different, different smaller groups, you know, there has to be more like concerted effort in, in the States probably, because, you know, I, I just Sorry, haven't I been, yeah. We just have two more minutes. So let me just ask to wrap up here. Um, just one short idea from each of you about what sort of one positive solutions oriented thing that we at large could, could be doing to, as you're saying, this is a long-term fight. There's no quick wins, you know, but like, I think people are wanting change and are ready. And so what's one thing that uh, we can be thinking about? I'll start. So, cause this is an impossible question. Mm -hmm. um, not just a hard question. So, but I'm going to do it by answering Sherry. She says, as part of par for corporate, why don't we just have corporations create multi-tests to be paid for by the government? I'm not sure I completely understand it, but I will answer as, as I understand it. 
it's not that the public institutions do everything that's, you know, right. They don't make food. Government doesn't make food, but they make sure it's safe, right? They don't make the tests, but they make sure that we get the tests. So the most important thing is to get control in two ways. And there's probably more than that. One is set the standards. When something is important for all, then, we, then our job is to set the standards, whether it's delivered publicly or privately, and make sure that there's cops on the beat, you know, enforcers and monitors to make sure that those standards are, uh, you know, are, are lived up to, you know, with sanctions if they're not. And you could take that to any level of government as a general concept and, and move, you know, pretty far down the list, pretty far down the line. I, I could give a ton of answers to maybe we could even, have, you know, we could do the whole day on this one or the whole, a whole session on it. But when it comes to uh, just focusing on political campaigns, I just want to pick out one little piece. I think even with that, there's a lot that can be done. Some of it comes to candidate recruitment, or the efforts by unions and such to get union members to run, people with more working class backgrounds, that you have a different perspective frequently. Uh, there's a lot of research on that than 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 others than other folks, and then also the kind of campaign techniques that are really much more engaging and involving avoiding ads that people see, a lot of door to door discussions, and kind of trying to have more in depth discussions with people that take account of what's going on in their lives, but also, you know, help them see how that has been affected and supported by things that government has done and therefore further steps can be made. Anyway, that's just a tiny bit of uh, really a lot of things that, that are possible. Real quick, I think we need a real investment in uh, kind of narrative and uh, media and communication strategies that goes like from community-based kind of, you know, grassroots organizing to, you know, institutions like the, the press and, and Hollywood and so that we're reiterating the role of privatization and corporate power and the impacts on people's lives, not just through us like crazy lefties running around screaming all the time, but when people also see those things reflected in stories, in music, in other, you know, kind of aspects of their lives that relate to them. And we, and, and, and frankly, funders have to stop treating communications work as not integral, right? Like I worked in many organizations where we had to kind of like lie about funding what was essentially like I was once a national public education director because that was the only way we could get the position funded when I was really the communications director, right? Like, so, you know, and, and too often, you know, starting a conversation with funders and, you know, funding social justice work, communications and narrative strategy is a non-starter, right? Like they don't see it as valuable as part of an organizing and advocacy strategy. And I think that that's one solution to kind of help us build on, you know, and to be able to get some traction on really reframing some of these narratives that, that dominate our culture. Excellent. And the one thing I'll add is that I think there's, you know, it's really hard to engage at the level of national politics, although it's important, but I think the closer to the ground we get and the closer to the places we live and work, um, this often the easier it is to take action. And so many of our grassroots partners here at Partners for Dignity and Rights are working on the level of school districts um, with employers to try to push for against sort of private power and private takeovers and for worker and community led models of accountability and community control. So you can find out more about all of our speakers and our work here um, in the chat. We have a uh, more links to everybody. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining. This, thank you, speakers, for joining. This is a real pleasure to have you. Our next webinar is going to be March 28th on the themes of food justice and food sovereignty. And thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for doing this, Ben. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. <laughs>